so uh, just first quick thing. Um, I want to remind everybody that we are not meeting next week, right? Uh, both classes are canceled. I have to take my wife to Jacksonville for some minor surgery. So we'll be out of town all week. Um, so just, you know, read Heart of Darkness. Um, I'll give you some reading questions for it when we're done here. And, you know, since we're just finishing up Robinson Crusoe, like, you know, today will take however long it takes. If we don't end up using the whole 75 minutes, we don't end up using the whole 75 minutes. That is what it is. Um, but uh, where was I going with that? Um, right, so, uh, right, Caleb, you would ask me about response papers, right? So remember, first re the first response paper, that folder is gonna close at the end of next week. So you need to get a response paper in by next Friday. Right, that's when for response paper one will be due. And you can get started on response paper two whenever, right, but that'll be due at the end of the following week, right? That's when that window is gonna close. Yes, Brendan. Oh, about the response paper. Because we've been reading Robinson Crusoe like in three sections, uh -huh. from, is it possible from each time, we have to, can we use a quote from like each section that we read or does it have to be from a different story each time? I, I was okay. Um, here's the thing: it's um, if we are doing a particular text over multiple sessions, then yes, you can write response papers on different sections of that particular book, right? Um, you know, we're doing it with Robinson Crusoe. We're going to be doing that uh, with things fall apart later. We're going to be doing it, I think, with Wide Sir Gas FC as well. There, are, you know, a lot. Midnight's Children is going to take us probably about three or four sessions to get through, right? Because it's a freaking doorstop, uh, but yeah. So you can do res you can do response papers from multiple um, different. Uh, I mean, from multiple different sections of the same text, right? Um, so by the end of week four, there we'll have, we will have read Robinson Crusoe. We'll also have read Heart of Darkness and The Man Who Would Be King, right? So you can also do response papers on either of those. Now, um, I was told, were you guys able to get copies of Heart of Darkness? Because the bookstore told me it was back ordered there. But. I think I ordered that on the Amazon. Okay. Chain, so I'm getting mine from the library. Okay. So, oh, so, so but right, point, point is, you, everybody's got it. You don't have it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you will buy uh, next week. Yes. Okay. Okay. Go on, they have uh, an edition that's like $3. Yeah, I think you get like Kindle edition. Yeah. I can see at the library for you. We have okay, awesome. Yeah, the, 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 there is a, yeah, the, there's the, a, a Dover Thrift edition, which it's, it's the right text. I mean, basically the reason I want you guys to buy the Norton Critical editions generally is because there's so much good supporting material um, in those, right? So like if you look like at the back of Robinson Crusoe here, there are a lot of, re a lot of classic essays on uh, Crusoe that explain a lot of concepts that will be helpful to you, you know, when you have to do the research papers or, or, or if there are, you know, just simply parts of the novel that you want context for that you want that are explained. But look, I mean, like if the, if the, you know, if the Norton Critical is too expensive for whatever reason, yeah, I mean, by all means buy the thrift edition. But it does mean you'll probably be looking at different page numbers than the rest of us. Okay, any other questions about any um, matters of form or timing or schedule? take your silence to me no all right so let's finish up with Crusoe then how'd the end of this go for you it got a lot better than it was <laughs> in the last like 30 pages it got okay better. <laughs> now by by better do you mean just that more was happening yeah it was yeah, I, I was like excited to keep reading it uh huh. The the first half, like the first part of it, was real dry. The, the I'm first. Not gonna lie, he took a long time to yeah. say stuff that he could have just said. Yeah. In like two sentences, he took a whole page to say. The and the, yeah, the first hundred ninety pages are pretty slow. Yeah. Things pick up a bit once he meets Friday. Yeah. And has another another person to interact with. But yeah, when it's just him doing stuff on the island. Yeah, most of the activities he describes are fairly mundane, right? I think, you know, the, the thing that is most interesting about those passages is also the stuff 
that's most disturbing mm -hmm. about her. You know, the, 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 the sorts of thoughts he has about about other people and about his place on this island and in the world. Yeah. Um, but then he meets other people and more stuff happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I mean, look, I mean, here's the thing. I, I really didn't expect you guys to enjoy this novel. It wasn't it's horrible. Not... I mean, okay, well, thank you. That's good. It just, it just got better at the end. <laughs> it, it was a, lot, a long time to build up, yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, we're, we're looking at this novel mostly for its historical importance and not, uh, not even necessarily because I think it's a particularly well-written example of 17th, century pro, or 17th and 18th century prose. Mostly what I'm interested in are its particular attitudes towards, um, towards the Americas and the people who lived there. That's a sort of primary um, interest for this one. Yeah, well, so what, what do you guys want to talk about today? Like, what, what do you guys have questions about or observations about? Yeah, Brandon. So um, does Crusoe's, Crusoe's attitude towards Friday, uh -huh. it's improved, but at the same time, I still think it's still kind of in a gray area. Because it wasn't uh -huh. that they start talking about religion and that he converted Friday, that he right. saw him as his equal, but at the same time, Continue the story. It keeps saying like savages, that savage or poor or something. Yeah. Does does he ever seem to come to regard Friday as an equal? No. Not entirely. No, and it, it's Friday's status here is kind of fuzzy, right? And this is one of the sort of central debates that scholars of this novel um, <clears throat> tie themselves in knots over, right? This this basic question, right? Is Friday a slave? What do you guys think? I'd say, in a way, yes. He's just treated better. But I mean, he still okay. has to do stuff for him. And like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. He just does whatever he says. So yeah, we talked, um, we, we can relate this back probably like when we first, the first day we did Crusoe, right? Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about, um, that French anthropologist, uh, Claude. Yeah, so anybody remember this? The distinctions he made be uh, between the condition and the state of slavery. Conditions, how well you're treated, and the state is like. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, you're sti you still realize that you're a slave. Yeah, that you don't have independence. Yeah. Yes, that you still lack agency, right? Condition refers to, yeah, the, the, whether you're poorly treated or well treated. State refers to, yeah, just the fact that you are a slave, whether you're treated well or not. Um, so, yeah, so Friday is reasonably well treated by Crusoe, right? Does Crusoe ever, like, I guess that this is the where the question comes in, that's like, Crusoe never refers to Friday as a slave, right? And does Crusoe himself have any moral qualms about or problems with the institution of slavery? No. No. He was going to get slaves. Yeah. Whenever he got Yeah. He, he owned slaves when he was in Brazil, right? He sold his boy Zuri as a slave. So clearly, like Crusoe has no qualms calling a slave a slave, right? And using slave labor. But he never calls Friday a slave, right? He'll call him my man. But doesn't he have him called my master? Servant. He does, but yeah, that's another one of these sort of weird gray areas, right? Yeah. He teaches Friday to call himself Friday, re regardless of whatever he was called in his own language. But kings don't call the people beneath them slaves. Mm -hmm. No. And I think he sees himself as the king of everything yeah. over there. Yeah, he starts talking at one point about his dominion and his subjects, right? Let's actually, yeah, let's go to that passage if we can find it, where he's, he's got, you know, his little kingdom 
running here. Um, let's see. This is after this after they've rescued the Spaniard and Friday's father. So if we look um, on page 174, my island was now peopled, and I thought myself very rich in subjects, and it was a merry reflection which I frequently made how like a king I looked. First of all, the whole country was my own mere property, so that I had an undoubted right of dominion. Secondly, my people were perfectly subjected. I was absolute lord and lawgiver. They all owed their lives to me and were ready to lay down their lives, if there had been occasion of it, for me. It was remarkable, too. We had but three subjects, and they were of three different religions. My man Friday was a Protestant. His father was a pagan and a cannibal. And the Spaniard was a papist. However, I allowed liberty of conscience throughout my dominions. But this is by the way. So yeah, he is talking about himself now as though he is the king of the island. And he refers to the other three people living on it, living on it with him now as his subjects. And why is it that he gets to be the king? How does he justify that? Okay, yeah, he, yeah, he built his, he built the castle, right? I remember even mm -hmm. in the um, the first hundred pages, he referred to himself as it's like I'm a king, I'm yeah. lord. Yeah, and he gives all of his little dwelling places English style names, right? You know, the castle, which is his main residence, his country estate and bower, right? He names everything after the kinds of, you know, dwelling places that an English aristocrat would, ha would have. And now, this is sort of all coming into reality. He's actually got subjects and is unquestioned master of the island. However, what else is it about all of his subjects that makes them subject to his will? What else do they all have in common? He was saved by it. Well, they were saved by him. They were saved by him, right? Yes. He rescued all of them from being killed and eaten, right? So every one of them he says owes Crusoe his life. Although one could argue that Friday's father and um, the Spaniard also owe Friday their lives. But as Crusoe might say, this is by the way. So what we see frequently happening here is that these things that start out as fantasies or fictions, right? Crusoe toying with the idea of being king of his island, for example, eventually find their way into becoming reality. Right? It starts as idle fantasy, as idle talk. But by the end of the novel, I mean, yeah. He is, for all intents and purposes, king of this island, right? And the relationship between a king and subjects is what? What do subjects have to do when the king shows up or when the king tells them to do something? They do it. Yeah, that's what subject here means, right? Subject to the king's will subject to the king's desires. So, and I, yeah, I think that this also yeah, complicates a little bit this slave idea, right? Does a king need slaves? Everybody has to do what he says anyway, right? Does a bourgeois planter who doesn't want to have to actually pay people wages need slaves. 
So when he was in that different state of life, right, his attitude was different. Now he sees himself differently in a different sort of social position. And so his view of his own relationship towards his people has changed as well. Friday and his father are not slaves, they are subjects. Now, the Spaniard also would not be fitting for Crusoe to regard as a slave. Why? He, isn't he like kind of on similar footing with Crusoe? Yeah, he's white, right? He's European. There are different religions, right? Now, the fact, the, does everybody know what the word papist means? Okay, nobody does. Okay, that's all right. Papist is a derogatory term for a Catholic. Right, so when you call someone a papist, basically what you're saying is they take all their orders from the Pope, right? You're accusing them of not being an independent thinker or of being sufficiently loyal to their particular nation, right? Their loyalty is to the Pope. Um, you still see, actually, a lot of this kind of rhetoric um, among Protestant communities in Northern Ireland. Right? They tend to refer to their Catholic neighbors uh, as papists um, and uh, to argue that if they are given political power, then they're going to subject everybody to the will of Rome. Right? This, this level of sort of Protestant paranoia was quite normal in Protestant countries in the 17th century. In fact, uh, up until uh, I think the mid 19th century in England, it was illegal for a Catholic to hold public office because the oath you had to take in order to become a member of parliament um, required you to um, renounce your allegiance to any system but you know, it required you to acknowledge the king as the head of the church, as the head of the church, and a Catholic wouldn't, in good conscience, do that. But yeah, that's just you know, side note there, historical side note. But something that might actually be important to remember as we're taught, as we're looking at other texts later on, nineteenth-century texts. Um, so yeah, so the, the Spaniard, they're they're uh, they're not co-religionists, but. Given that the Spaniard is white, Crusoe does not treat him the same way he does uh, most of the Caribbean, right? In fact, if we even look at his first meeting with the captain of the ship who's been marooned by his mutinous men, on Crusoe's island, right? Interesting thing about this, does Crusoe ever bother to try to find out why the men mutinied? No. I'm wondering that, too, because yeah. he did something to cause him to do that. Yeah, I mean, what, what he if... He just took his uh, automatically. Yeah, he automatically sides with the authority figure, right? He automatically mm -hmm. sides with the captain. Uh, now, might there be pragmatic reasons for this? If he helps save that captain's life get and get him a ship back. That's true. Yeah. That gets him back on a ship bound for England, right? Mm -hmm. So he certainly would have pragmatic reasons to favor the captain's interest, right? You owe me a favor now, buddy. But that captain could have also done some really terrible things that caused yeah. all those people to rebel against him. Yeah. He didn't bother to ask. Yeah, not, not important to him, right? <laughs> he doesn't even know if he's a trustworthy mm -hmm. man or not. He takes that for, yeah, he seems to take that on faith. Um, so if you look on page 184, right, where are those brutes your enemies, said I? Do you know where they are gone? There they lie, sir, said he, pointing to a thicket of trees. My heart trembles for fear they have seen us and heard you speak. If they have, they will certainly murder us all. Have they any firearms, said I. He answered they had only two pieces, and one which they left in the boat. 
Well then, said I, leave the rest to me. I see they are all asleep. It is an easy thing to kill them all. But shall we rather take them prisoners? Is this a course of action that he ever considers in dealing with the natives of the place? Not really, right? He talks at one point about you know, considering taking some of them as slaves before he meets Friday. But he doesn't have these same, these same kinds of qualms of conscience about simply killing the Kari, right? They're cannibals. They're not like him. So, what was I going to say? <laughs> I, had, I had a thought rolling. <laughs> it just up and evaporated. Um, Carib, cannibals, killing, <laughs> or not killing, as the case may be. Um, all right, let me, let me just do it like it. Do you guys have any questions so far about any of this, by the way, or observations about anything else while I mull over what it was I was actually trying to say? Try to get my thought back. I have an observation that I mm -hmm. feel like he was better off on the island and more satisfied <laughs> than whenever he finally got off of it. Okay. Why would you say why do you why would you say that? Why do you think that? He just seemed happier on the island to me. I don't know. And then when he got off he just they went through a lot of stuff, I feel like. Yeah, I mean he's on the island nearly thirty years, right? Mm -hmm. He's on the island for nearly 30 years. Um, virtually everyone he knew was, was dead. is dead or assumed he was dead, yeah. right? So when he comes back out into the world, he's basically a non-person. He's still isolated. Yeah. He was better on the island, in my opinion, because when he comes out, he's isolated. And it's uh -huh. basically like he's on the island. So he, did, he doesn't have anybody. Yeah. I mean, on the island, he's king, yeah. right? <laughs> on the island, he's in charge. This is his unquestioned dominion. In fact, um, what is it? What's, what's the fiction that he sets up with the captain of the ship? What's the little ruse they set up to trick the mutineers? What does he refer to Crusoe as? Governor. Oh, yeah, the governor. Yeah, the governor of the island, right? <laughs> now, he has no official title to the island. He's just some dude dressed in goat skins who's been living here for 30 years. But this is another one of those cases in which what starts as a discursive fiction becomes reality, right? The governor has to be hidden away at first because he's this wild-looking, long-haired, bearded dude dressed in goatskins, right? There's no way the mutinous men are going to believe that that's the governor. So in order to make the fiction plausible, the captain sends back to the ship for new clothes and soap and scissors and a razor, right? And they clip Crusoe down, wash the stink off of him, and put him in some Euro European clothes again. And then he makes a convincing governor. Still a fantasy, right? Still not really the governor. But then what is he leaving behind on the island when he goes? His status. Yeah, he still has, he, he has status there, right? Mm -hmm. But what has he physically left behind on that island? Is it going to be uninhabited anymore? There's still people around. Yeah, a couple of the mutineers are going to be left behind, right? And the Spaniards are coming back. Doesn't Friday's dad come back? Yeah. I never understood why they left him on the island. I was confused. Yeah. Well, I, oh, I think this, this is what I was getting at, actually, a moment ago. So thank you for bringing us back to this point, Lindsay. Yes. Um, Okay, so 
Crusoe has fundally, fundamentally misunderstood something about the Carib and their practice of cannibalism, right? Do they eat human flesh simply for sustenance? No. No, right? Nobody does that. No, nobody does that. Isn't it like a form of punishment while they're doing it? Yeah, who, who are the people that they eat? Against them, I guess, or yeah. enemies. People they've taken in war, yeah. Mm -hmm. They only eat prisoners of war, right? And that's what Friday tries to explain to him at one point. It's like, no, like, if we go back, you know, if, if I take you to my nation, right? No, they're not going to eat you, mm -hmm. right? We don't do that to just anywhere. These 16 Spaniards have been living among us, right? They made a truce with us and agreed to be peaceful. And so, yeah, we haven't eaten them, right? So we're not going to eat you either. Crusoe's not entirely convinced by this, right? But it does demonstrate that not all of his paranoia is entirely, it, well, okay, but most of his paranoia is not really justified, right? That he's afraid of people who don't mean him any specific harm and who would probably only be his enemies if he presented a danger to them. Now, one could argue that, yes, showing up at their gatherings and shooting them, yeah, that presents a danger, right? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Brandon, what were you going to say? Yeah, well, you said that, uh, I just remember, like, at the beginning of our reading session thing, the Crusoe made, like, different barriers inside the fort mm -hmm. to prevent from, like, from being hurt. Like, he kept his yeah. eyes and everything, but he said... He knew Friday wouldn't hurt him, but that still kind of confused mm -hmm. me a little why he did all that, even though he knew Friday wouldn't hurt him. Yeah, well, he, he becomes paranoid about Friday at one point, right? Mm -hmm. When Friday shows, you know, sees his own, his own island, right? Oh, yeah. from the main. He's from, go back yeah. Oh, Friday. Yeah. First, now that he knows where he is, first chance he gets. He's going to go back, get more of his people, and they're going to kill me, right? Crusoe thinks everyone wants to kill him. Now, you know, it doesn't really go into the kind of childhood Crusoe had, right? You know, maybe, you know, maybe he didn't get on well with other kids. Maybe everyone did want to kill him, right? He is kind of annoying and rude. Yeah. Yeah. And, and entitled, right? Yeah. yeah. Selfish. Mm hmm Yeah, he's got a lot of personality flaws. <laughs> so yeah, maybe lots of people do want to squash him like a bug. But yeah, um, <clears throat> to get back to this whole thing about being the governor, we feel like we um, we keep like sort of like starting on a point and then taking the taking detours, like coming back to it. So, all right, to get back to the whole governor thing. Yeah, he's leaving behind a colony. By which he hopes to profit. Right? These guys are going to stay behind, maintain the island and hopefully make some money for him, right? So yeah, by the end here, this is Crusoe's Island. It's believed, by the way, that the island, uh, by scholars who require um, there to be literal foundations for everything in a novel, it is believed that the island that Crusoe is marooned on is a Juan Fernandez Island off the coast of South America. And Crusoe's story is in fact loosely based on the experiences of a Scottish sailor by the name of Alexander Selkirk. Selkirk 
um, had an argument. He was a, nav uh, a navigator, a ship's navigator. And he had an argument with the captain under whom he was serving about the seaworthiness of the vessel that they were on, right? Selkirk was not convinced that the ship was actually in good enough condition to continue sailing. The captain said, fuck it, it's fine. So because they could not come to agreement, Selkirk said, okay, I'm not getting back on that leaky tub. You just leave me here on this island, which the captain obligingly did. Selkirk was not marooned for nearly as long as Crusoe was. Right? He was not alone. for He was there for a few years. But by the time he was discovered, um, he had nearly forgotten how to talk. It had been so long since he'd interacted with other human beings. And he did not um, readjust easily when he was brought back to London. Um, he briefly became a celebrity, ran through his money very quickly, um, got sick and died. So again, this is the, sto the, the, the basic story on which Crusoe is based. Um, it's not a happy one. But let's go back to Crusoe's interactions with Friday. Right, Friday's attachment, do, to what extent do Friday's attachments to Crusoe seem to be more or less voluntary? I think this is another thing that sort of creates a little bit of a gray area. When we talk about whether or not Friday should be regarded as a slave or servant. Does he want, is he willing to leave Crusoe at any point? No. no. Yeah, even when he wants to go back to his nation, right? He wants Master to come with him. He gets very upset when Crusoe tries to send him away and insists that Crusoe kill him instead, right? So he does seem to have attached himself voluntarily and even to be affectionate towards Crusoe. But one thing that's been noted, uh, that was even noted in Defoe's own, by Defoe's own critics uh, in the early 18th century, um, Friday is with Crusoe for years, right? Does his English ever get any better? Eventually. Well, does he ever stop does he ever stop speaking broken English in the text of the novel? No. Yeah. yeah, his English is always represented as being um, kind of clumsy, no matter how long he's been speaking and practicing the language. Right, so this is one, uh, one more way in which Friday is represented as a kind of other. And yet there are also ways in which he is uh, more clever than Crusoe, or certainly thinks of things that don't occur to Crusoe. If we um, look on page 157, right, when Crusoe is trying to instruct Friday in Christian theology. <laughs> you're, you're like, what did you find funny about this, Steve? Is this the one I'm thinking of? Uh, I don't remember the part, but uh, he's trying to explain to him about uh, the devil, I think. And, yeah. And he's like, well, then why won't he just stop him? Like, yeah. Duh, that would solve everything. Yeah. Like, why? If he's, yeah. So, if, yeah. Like, why? he's like, if he's so great, uh -huh. why not just end this all and it would solve all the problems? And the, and, I know. And, and, <laughs> that's and, and, not me thinking. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and the thing's like, what Friday has sort of accidentally and innocently hit upon is one of the oldest problems in the history of philosophy and particularly a Christian apologetics, right? If God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good, then why does he allow evil to exist, right? 
Why is evil permitted in the world? So the, this particular problem is called by theologians and philosophers a theo, uh, the problem of theodicy. I'm not entirely, apart from the theo part, which I know is Greek for God, I'm not really sure exactly what this translates to. But basically what theodicy means right, is this attempt to solve the problem of evil in the world, right? If God is all-powerful, all-good, and all-knowing, why is there evil? And a lot of 18th century texts that deal with colonialism in various ways um, try to cover this particular problem. Um, I think part of it is just, uh, you know, trying, like a kind of moral reckoning with the idea of colonialism in the first place. It maybe it's part of what sparks it. But there's a guy by the name of Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz, German philosopher and mathematician, the fondest for quality. Um, and yeah, if you ever see uh, pictures of this gentleman, like fabulously bewigged, like really fabulously bewigged. Um, Leibniz tried to solve this particular problem by arguing that we lived in the best of all possible worlds. That <clears throat> God could not create a better world than this one. And that everything in this world tends towards the good, even if we don't see that immediately. Right? Leibniz uh, belonged to a school of thought uh, known as rationalism. Right. Rationalists were often mathematicians as well as philosophers, and they tended to believe in the idea of a sort of rationally ordered universe in which everything has observable, predictable rules and makes sense, right? Everything is ordered to some purpose. Now, there are a couple of problems with Leibniz's theodicy, right? So if the world that we live in is the best world God could possibly create, yet it is still flawed, what does that do to the proposition that God is all-powerful? If God is all-powerful, theoretically he could create a perfect world, right? But Leibniz says that he can't, and yet tries to continue to maintain the idea that God is all-powerful by saying that everything tends towards a good that we can't see. I guess you could argue that you don't, you can't know what's good without knowing what's evil. Yeah, and, and, and that is, that is another um, <clears throat> argument that has been used in uh, some of these theodicies, right? That, that knowledge of, the knowledge of good requires, knowledge of what is good requires knowledge of what is evil. Mm -hmm. But, in a state of perfect innocence, right? if there is no evil in the world to begin with, do you actually need concepts of good and evil at all? Right? People will just naturally do good without knowing what to call it. So, you know, this, this is a really, really thorny problem. And it is one that has bedeviled thinkers for a very long time. Now, the reason I bring this up in the context of colonialism is that um, Voltaire's short novel, Candide, which details the protagonist's journey um, across the New World and back to Europe, um, is in fact a takedown of Leibniz's very idea, right? Writers like Voltaire argued that someone like Leibniz, right, if Leibniz believes that we live in the best of all possible worlds, then he is clearly ignoring the evidence of his senses. Right? So writers would often present 
worlds that clearly did not add up to this kind of theodicy, right? right? In order to believe that we actually live in the best of all possible worlds, you have to accept that God is then willing to let lots and lots of people suffer needlessly. And yeah, this is sort of part of the thing that Friday is hitting on here. Look on page 157, right? I found it was not so easy to imprint right notions in his mind about the devil as it was about the being of a god. Nature assisted all my arguments to evidence to him, even the necessity of a great first cause and overruling governing power, a secret directing providence, and of the equity and justice of paying homage to him that made us and the like. But there appeared nothing of all this in the notion of an evil spirit, of his original, his being, his nature, and above all of his inclination to do evil, and to draw us in to do so too. And the poor creature puzzled me once in such a manner by a question merely natural and innocent that I scarce knew what to say to him. I had been talking a great deal to him of the power of God, his omnipotence, his dreadful nature to sin, his being a consuming fire to the workers of iniquity. How? As he had made us all, he could destroy us in all the world in a moment, and he listened with great seriousness to me all the whole. After this, I had been telling him how the devil was God's enemy in the hearts of men, and used all his malice and skill to defeat the good designs of providence, and to ruin the kingdom of Christ in the world, and the like. Well, says Friday, but you say God is so strong, so great, is he not much strong, much might as the devil? Yes, yes, said I, says I, Friday, God is stronger than the devil, God is above the devil, and therefore we pray to God to tread him down under our feet and enable us to resist his temptations and quench his fiery darts. But, says he again, if God much strong, much might as the devil, why God no kill the devil, so make him no more do wicked. I was strangely surprised at his question. And after all, though I was now an old man, yet I was but a young doctor, and ill enough qualified for a casuist or a solver of difficulties. And at first I could not tell what to say, so I pretended not to hear him, and asked him what he said. But he was too earnest for an answer to forget his question, so that he repeated it in the very same broken words as above. By this time I had recovered myself a little, and I said, God will at last punish him severely. He is reserved for the judgment, and is to be cast into the bottomless pit to dwell with everlasting fire. This did not satisfy Friday. But he returns upon me, repeating my words, reserve at last we no understand. But why not kill the devil now, not kill great ago? You may as well ask me, said I, why God does not kill you and I when we do wicked things that offend him. We are preserved to repent and be pardoned. He muses a while at this. Well, well, says he mighty affectionately, that well. So you, I, devil, all wicked, all preserve, repent, God pardon all. Here I was run down again by him to the last degree, and it was a testimony to me how the mere notions of nature, though they will guide a reasonable creature to the knowledge of God and of a worship or homage due to the supreme being, of God as a consequence of our nature, yet, know nothing, but, yet nothing but divine revelation can form the knowledge of Jesus Christ and of a redemption purchased for us of a mediator of the new covenant and of an intercessor at the footstool of God's throne. I say nothing but a revelation from heaven, so on and so forth, right, right? So does Crusoe ever come up with an answer to Friday's question? Never, right? First he dodges it by pretending he didn't hear it. And Friday's chain of reasoning is perfectly logical, right? It's like, okay, if God is stronger than the devil, why doesn't he kill the devil? Okay, God preserves all sinners to give them the opportunity to repent, so the devil has the opportunity to repent too, right? And because Crusoe can't answer that question, he just starts musing about divine revelation, right? Only divine revelation can answer that for you. So never get never gets around to actually dealing with the content of Friday's question. So Friday actually betrays in his innocence a kind of intellectual sophistication that Crusoe himself can't quite deal with and can't quite handle. Even though in other, even as in other ways, he makes Friday into more or less 
the image or the copy of himself, right? Right down to the fact that, as we talked about last time, he forces Friday to start wearing clothes like Crusoe's, even though it's impractical to do so in their climate, mostly to avoid offending Crusoe's own concepts of modesty, right? Now, if we look at this is actually probably mostly because I'm, just, I'm kind of soft-hearted about animals. One of the portions of the novel that actually upsets me most is the encounter with the bear at the end of the novel. We're used to seeing Crusoe pointlessly, needlessly, and cruelly kill animals, right? We've seen him do that with the lion, um, the, cats. the cats, yeah, he drowns the cats. Um, yeah, I mean, the goats at least he's using as a food source, right? There's a practical reason for killing the goats. But, you know, he makes that sort of display of power to Friday, right, by shooting a parrot, which is no good for food, right? He can't eat it. He does it merely to show off the power of his guns, right? To make Friday think that he has powerful magic. So why is it disturbing that it's Friday who taunts and kills the bear in this case? He picked up that behavior from... Yeah. Or he learned it from um, Crystal. Yeah. I feel like he was like that before. Yeah, I mean, they're not going to eat the bear. And the bear isn't actually bothering them, right? The wolves that attack them, okay, that's, that's one thing, different. right? That's different, right? They're defending themselves from the wolves. But we're specifically told that the bear is not aggressive. If we look on page 211, right? Never was a fight managed so heartily and in such a surprising manner as that which followed between Friday and the bear which gave us all, though at first we were surprised and afraid for him, the greatest diversion imaginable. As the bear is a heavy, clumsy creature, and does not gallop as the wolf does, who is swift and light, so he has two particular qualities which are generally the rule of his actions. First, as to men who are not his proper prey. I say not his proper prey, because though I cannot say what excessive hunger might do, which was now their case, the ground being all covered with snow, but as to men, he does not usually attempt them unless they first attack him. On the contrary, if you meet him in the woods, if you don't meddle with him, he won't meddle with you. But then you must take care to be very civil to him and give him the road, for he's a very nice gentleman, and he won't go a step out of his way for a prince. You know, this just occurred to me, too. Um, and I think this also just sort of, sort of goes to show um, how full of shit Defoe is in a number of ways. Um, why, shouldn't a, why should a bear not even be out at this particular moment in the story? Because it's winter and they're hibernating? Yeah. yeah. Supposed to be hibernating. <laughs> yeah shouldn't, it be, think about <laughs> shouldn't the bear be hibernating? Yeah. Why, why is there a bear there in the first place? Yeah, I always wondered, like, when I read this, I was like, why, why is the bear out? And uh -huh. I was like, what was the what's the point in putting this in there? I was like, yeah. is, is this to like make Friday look like an asshole now? Because, cause, yeah. I mean, we, we, you know, we pretty much solidified that that's Crusoe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That Crusoe is one at this point, <laughs> but now we have to, but then when we got uh -huh. to like the scene with the fight, it honestly reminded me of that part in Django and Jane when they have like the two slaves fighting. Yeah. And it, it reminded me of that part mm -hmm. and I was, yeah. Well, there, there was a popular, um, I'm not going to call it a sport, but it was regarded as an entertainment um, in Europe uh, in sort of like the 16th through the 18th centuries. It was called bear baiting. And what, you, what they did was they would, you know, take a captive bear um, and starve it yeah. to make it aggressive. They'd chain it up in a pit, and people would pay... Uh, to watch trained dogs attack it. Yeah, I mean, so 
we are talking about a society in which people were generally crueler to animals um, than we're accustomed. We talked a little bit about that last time. But yeah, I mean, this, you know, Crusoe can describe this as a diversion and an entertainment, in part probably because he is familiar with bear baiting. Um, which, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's a horrible thing to do. Um, and Friday is picking up these habits and these tendencies as well. And it's also becoming, like Crusoe, uh, wasteful and cruel. But <laughs> when we get to the sort of the idea to, again, like bears being abroad in winter, right? A couple of things we have to remember um, about Defoe's narrative. Um, it is in no way based on personal experience. All of his information about the world outside of England is secondhand. He has no direct experience of the Americas. He has no direct experience of slave economies. He has no direct experience of a plantation or of island life. And apparently also no direct experience of bears. So where Crusoe fits into a particular literary tradition, right, there is a long line going back to the Middle Ages of travel narratives that were read for entertainment before there was any such thing as a novel, right? Now, probably the two most famous examples in Europe would have been the travels of Marco Polo. Any of you familiar with Marco Polo at all? I've heard of it. I think there was a Netflix series or something, right, fictionalizing mm -hmm. his life. Okay, so who's Marco Polo? Who's an explorer? Wasn't he the person? No, that's crazy. But he still trying to get to India, or he went to India and brought about spices. Yeah, but yeah, Polo didn't actually sail yeah, anywhere. He a trade route, right? Yeah, they went along an established trade route. Yeah. Uh, he's a Venetian merchant who traveled along an already established trade route through Central Asia. And so, you know, I guess mo mostly what is now Pakistan rather than India, um, to China. And entered the service there of the Yuan Emperor uh, Kublai Khan. And what he did, because Polo had a remarkable facility with languages, he traveled to various portions of Kublai Khan's domains and wrote descriptions of them for the places the Khan couldn't get to himself, wrote descriptions of them, and sort of reported back to the Khan about the economy of the area, right? About customs and social practices, and about weird and exotic creatures that he encountered there, right? So for example, um, there's a, a famous excerpt from his travels where he talks about visiting the island of Sumatra and he describes there what he calls a unicorn. But he says it looks nothing like Europeans believe the unicorn is supposed to look. It has flap, you know, flaps of gray skin like armor, a single horn on the end of its nose rather than in its forehead, and <clears throat> um, a very, very forceful and powerful charge, right? Now, what creature is he actually describing? Rhinoceros. Yeah, it's a rhinoceros. It's not a, it's not a freaking unicorn, right? <laughs> but because he has no direct experience of a rhinoceros, right? He has no frame of reference for this creature. This is the first example of it he's ever seen, right? He compares it to a concept with which he's already familiar. And this is a fairly common trick in travel narratives, right? You will see a European traveler 
encounter something he'd never seen before and try to fit it into his already pre-existing framework of ideas, right? Now, the other particularly famous medieval travel narrative um, is the book with an E on the end of John Mandeville. Now, the primary difference between Polo's travel narrative and Mandeville's, right, is one, Polo was a real person who actually went to the places he described. John Mandeville, as far as we can tell, did not exist. And his book is largely cobbled together from other travelers' accounts, from fantasy and from hearsay, right? For example, we get from Mandeville um, that there are nations on the coast of Africa where people have the heads of dogs, right? Not true, but this was a common European legend in the Middle Ages, right? We can tell that Mandeville actually knows nothing about navigation and has never been to most of the places he describes um, when he says, for example, that in the Southern Hemisphere there is another pole star, right? That just as we have a pole star in, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the, star, the North Star Polaris in the Northern Hemisphere, so there is a Southern Star as well. Now, you can navigate in the Southern Hemisphere using, you know, the constellation, the Southern Cross, which also never moves, right? It's always in the same position. But anybody who'd actually been to the Southern Hemisphere would know that there is no pole star, right, down there. So why do I bring this up? Well, because Defoe is, in a lot of ways for his readers, doing the same sorts of things that Polo and Mandeville, whoever the hell he was, were doing for theirs, right? He is presenting for an English audience a place and people whom they would regard as exotic for entertainment. Right? Holding up the Americas as kind of something to be consumed by an audience. And if people are willing to consume tales of the Americas, right, then that feeds directly into a colonialist enterprise in which they are also keen to consume American goods and territory. All right, so I've more or less said my piece about this. Do you guys have any questions or comments or observations before we uh, put this to rest. Anything else at all you guys want to discuss? So, yeah, Brandon. To sum up Robinson Crusoe, the main point is like how um, colonialism got started, or um, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say there necessarily is a main point that we need to get out of this. We've actually, you know, we've. We've covered a whole bunch of related points and related ideas, but yeah, the reason I wanted you guys to read this is because this is a text written at the very beginning of the English colonialist enterprise um, that I think really kind of gets into both the, mi the pre-existing mindset of the colonizer and the imperialist and their attitudes towards other places and cultures and towards how that kind of mindset can then be spread and consumed through literature. Does that answer your question, more or less? Yeah. OK, anything else? All right, then let me give you the reading questions for Heart of Darkness. I'll let you go a little bit early today. Um, and uh, yeah, have yourselves a good weekend.